Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tammy Wilson from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and I'm the project lead for the California Dyslexia Initiative. We are excited to have so many friends and colleagues from across California and other locations join us for this learning opportunity. Welcome to the 22-23 CDI Expert Webinar Series. In this year's series, we will learn more about identifying risk factors, setting up effective MTSS RTI school systems to prevent reading difficulties, and delivering research-based instruction to support and remediate struggling learners and students at risk for and with dyslexia. Today, we are excited to feature Dr. Jessica Tost. There's a lot of wonderful content to be explored in this webinar, and I know you will learn a lot. Um, we've created a Padlet with the slides, as well as on our website, we have webinar companion documents so that you can continue to explore the content and discuss it with colleagues uh, back in your school sites. The recordings will be posted on our website about a week after the session. The county office, Sacramento County office, is the project lead on this initiative, and one of the goals is to provide professional learning within the system of support to build knowledge, skill, and capacity around teaching and supporting struggling readers and students at risk for and with dyslexia. We are really excited to partner with our friends at Glean Education, who are supporting us in delivering this expert webinar series. So I am going to hand the mic over to the founder and CEO of Glean Education and also my friend, Jessica mm -hmm. Hammond. Thank you so much, Tammy. We are thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series for the second year in a row. For those of you who may not know us, Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. And you can find us at www.gleaneducation.com or on Instagram or Twitter. So this webinar is the second webinar in a series of webinars that focus on understanding dyslexia within an MTSS framework. If you haven't registered for the others yet, we'll be putting the registration links in the chat so you can be sure not to miss them. For this webinar, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Jessica Tost. Dr. Tost is an associate professor in the Department of Special Education at the University of Texas at Austin. She holds research affiliations with the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk and the Texas Center for, Edu for Equity Promotion. Her research is focused on methods for intensifying intervention for students with persistent reading challenges and reading disabilities, including dyslexia. She is the principal investigator on research grants from the U.S. Department of Education, Institute of Education Sciences. These projects aim to develop and test intervention programs that support students with or at risk for reading disability. Dr. Toss was the, was the recipient of the Dean's Distinguished Teaching Award in 2022 and was named one of the Texas 10 professors at UT Austin in 2017. Please help me welcome Dr. Jessica Tost. Thank you, Jessica. Um, welcome to everyone. I am really excited to be here this afternoon to spend a little bit of time with you. Um, I'm going to be focusing today on uh, broadly talking about screening and assessment across tiers of an MTSS framework, and I'm really framing this time together to think about how database decision making, so making instructional decisions that use student assessment data, can support reading achievement. So as introduced, I'm Jessica Tost. Um, I've been at the University of Texas at Austin for nine years now, um, and before I be I went into academia, I was a elementary teacher, a special education teacher, and a reading interventionist, um, and worked primarily in elementary schools in Canada before moving to the US. So a little bit of, of lay of the land, I think you should be able to receive to get the handouts on the Padlet link that was shared, but I also have a tiny URL here and you can scan the QR code 
to get a PDF of my slides. And there's also in the folder that's linked another PDF that's um, a handout, list, like a resource list. So it's a two page handout that has a link to all of the websites that I'll mention in this talk. And any if you see any references at the bottom of my slides, there's a reference list at, uh, on that link as well. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give some examples as we go through. So I'll mention a number of websites. So please don't feel like you need to scramble to write down all the websites. You can find them on that list. So momentarily, I'll tell you kind of where we're going to go in this short time together, but we're going to do a lot in this short time together. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will have time at the end to get to some questions. If you feel like following me on Twitter or tweeting at me throughout the talk, nice things only, um, throughout the talk, my Twitter handle is at Dr. Tost. Um, and I'll share my email and website address at the end, but it's also on the handout if you ever uh, need to contact me. So I'm going to start briefly with an overview of learning to read and things we think about in learning to read and helping students learn to read. And then the majority of our time is going to be talking about database decision making. So I'll talk about supporting students in an MTSS framework and then dive a little deeper into curriculum based measurement as a form of assessment and data based instruction. Um, and I'll end with, I hope, what the, the big takeaways are from our time together. So. I share this quote in probably almost every training and talk I give. I share this quote by John Steinbeck, um, and I will read it, although it's on the screen so you can see it as well. But the quote is this, some people there who, being grown, forget the horrible task of learning to read. It is perhaps the greatest single effort that the human undertakes, and he must do it as a child. And so I share this quote to really think about all of the steps that are involved in, in mastering literacy in becoming literate and how complex that is and how there's a lot going on for our young students as they're going through this process of learning to read. And for students who have reading disabilities like dyslexia, there are even more challenges in getting through these miles, these developmental milestones. So learning to read involves mastering multiple developmental stages. And as you all know, it involves not only the ability to decode words accurately and automatically, but also the ability to construct and comprehend the meaning of text. And so these are two very big buckets of skills that students have to develop. And literacy for all of us, most of us on this call are teachers or work in education, so we, we do not need convincing um, about the importance of literacy, but it's a high stakes educational issue, it has an impact on students' success at school, but literacy is also highly related to social outcomes, economic outcomes, and public health more broadly. So it is a high stakes issue for us to be thinking about and to prioritize how we're supporting students in our schools. Um, you may have seen this before. This is Scarborough's Reading Rope. Um, I'm not going to talk about it in detail. You may, one of your other webinars may get into it, but I want to put it on the screen to really highlight the notion that reading development is a complex cognitive process. This rope, this figure, shows all of the different skills involved that students need to develop that start working together over time to become a skilled reader. They become increasingly automatic in the way they access text, increasingly strategic in the way they think about text and work with text, and then they become able to use text in the way that we hope they will to gain information, to take meaning away. But all of these skills can be areas where one has difficulty. And so we need to think of how complex these processes are. And to do that, we have to make sure the instruction we're providing to students is guided by the science of what works, for whom, and under which conditions. So really thinking about how we can ensure that the time we spend in instruction is going to benefit our students. And I'll briefly to say, when I say the science of what works for whom and under what conditions, I'm referring to broadly what's called the science of reading. And by that, it's an accumulation of knowledge from 40 plus years of high quality studies that have been conducted that really help us understand how reading skills develop for young readers, for beginning readers, and also for struggling readers. 
um, what skills and what knowledge predicts reading proficiency for students, and what instructional approaches are most effective. And this body of knowledge is constantly being added to and evolving over time, but really understanding this research and this work helps us make informed instructional decisions. So you may be, I'm gonna get into assessment. I think you may be thinking, why are we talking about instruction? This is supposed to be about assessment today, which is a great question if you're thinking that. Um, and I'm talking about instruction a little bit to get started because for me, there are many, many reasons why we use assessment data. For me, the most important reason is using that data to inform the instruction that we deliver. And that if we're collecting data from students, if we're assessing students, that should inform the way we serve them and the way we support them in their reading development. Um, this is a figure, I just love the graphic that was developed by Nancy Young, who is a Canadian um, practitioner, a clinician. And it really kind of demonstrates the range of students within any classroom, the percentage of students, the green at the top, there are a percentage of students in every classroom who will learn to read very easily and do not need direct instruction. They need broad instruction, support, access to materials, and they will develop and grow in your classroom. Probably about half of the students in our classrooms require instruction. They require explicit, systematic, sequential instruction in order to make gains. And then there's a smaller percentage of students in every classroom who have a reading disability, such as dyslexia, who will require more explicit, systematic, sequential instruction over time, and that's more intensive over time. And so the students who fall into really what is 50 to 60 percent of all of the students in our classrooms are students who really require good evidence-based reading instruction. And the students who in the, the orange group who may require that instruction to make gains, if they're not getting explicit systematic instruction early in their development, then they are also at risk for continuing to struggle for struggling and falling behind. And so as we get into talking about MTSS, we'll be talking about students who have persistent severe reading challenges and how data can inform the instruction that we deliver for those that group of learners. So let's talk about within an MTSS framework. So MTSS is really, I'm, good, I, I'm gonna use MTSS, you may also be familiar with response to intervention or RTI, but really these are frameworks that talk about integrating instruction, intervention, and assessment systems to meet the needs of all learners. The, this delivery model really relies on there being well-implemented and research-based instruction, intervention, and assessment practices. And so within that, we have strong, high-quality classroom instruction. We have evidence-based intervention programs for pre early intervention, um, for prevention, so targeted support, and also more intensive intervention. And we're really systematically using assessment data to make decisions within this framework. So this is a very commonly used pyramid for MTSS. And the main idea of what's happening in the pyramid is that we are really increasing the intensity of supports. So this is almost the upside down version of what I was just showing Nancy Young's figure, um, that students, once we move up in the triangle, are gonna require a greater intensity of supports. And so in your system and schools that you've worked in, you may use different words to label each of the tiers. But tier one is what we generally would call universal um, core reading instruction. And so core reading instruction, if it's high quality, research-based classroom instruction should meet the needs of a large group of our students. Tier two is targeted. So tier two is additional support that targets areas where students need more skill development. And oftentimes some students may need tier two support in certain areas and they will gain the skills that they really need more targeted support to gain. And then we'll tier one will be enough for them moving on. Tier three is what we often call intensive. So this is a smaller group of students. This is often where students who have um, reading, more significant reading disabilities, dyslexia will fall, that they need more intensive supports over time. And these inter interventions need to be intensified and individualized to really meet the specific needs of the students who we serve. So in order to do this, in order to make decisions about who needs what level of support, 
what that support needs to look like, um, when we intensify or remove interventions that students are, relieving, are receiving, we need to make sure we're using assessment data. We need to make sure that we understand how students are performing um, and we're, we're regularly thinking about the decisions we're making instructionally. And so when we're collecting data, we really want, there, we collect a lot of data, um, but we wanna make sure as much as possible, we're using things that are brief and efficient to administer. We don't have a lot of time to give away to assessments. We wanna optimize our instructional time. We wanna make sure we're using measures that are reliable and, and valid. And then we also wanna make sure as much as possible that every piece of data that we collect and the time we spend collecting it will directly inform our instruction, that it will tell us something about what students need. And so I'm gonna talk in a little more detail about one type of assessment system called CBM um, that you may have heard before. So CBM stands for curriculum-based measurement. So curriculum-based measurement is a system of ongoing data collection to monitor student performance. And so it's meant, it was designed originally to really look at performance over time, to be collected frequently, and to make a good informed decisions about what students need instructionally. And so CBM probes that are designed um, are meant to produce scores that are reliable and valid. They're meant to be sensitive to change in students' academic progress over time, so that we're meant to be able to see, unlike a standardized test that we might use, we likely would not see a lot of change from week to week as students receive intervention. Um, but with CBM, we're able to see change from week to week or every two weeks or every month, depending on when you're administering it, as students make progress. They are also simple and efficient to administer. So I am not, uh, I'm not throwing my ring in the hat of any CBM system, but some that you may be using in some of your schools or have seen before. Um, would be things like Dibbles, AmesWeb, EasyCBM, FastBridge, MClass. These are all CBM systems. So most commonly for the purpose of instructional decision-making, the most commonly used CBM reading measure involves students reading a passage out loud. Um, this is generally called, depending on the system you're using, it's generally called oral reading fluency, ORF. Um, or it may be called CBM reading, depending on the, the system you're using. But students read for one minute, it's timed reading, and then you calculate the number of errors they had in the passage that they read. And we know there's work that's been done looking at, the, looking at CBM measures and what kind of information these measures give us. And we know that ORF scores, so this oral reading fluency scores, are most strongly associated with standardized measures of student reading achievement. And so these scores on, on how students perform in these read aloud passages really tell us a lot about how students will do throughout the year. Um, this is an example. This is a first grade passage um, from Acadians, which is a prior version of Dibbles. Um, and this is a middle of year first grade passage. So the student would read the text and the teacher would mark the errors that the student makes. So what does this look like? How are you gonna use the CBM data within an MTSS system? So I mentioned before, one of the hallmarks of MTSS is you have these increasing intensity of supports but you also have an increasing frequency of assessments. And so when students are receiving universal tier one instruction, there isn't a need to conduct an assessment, even something as simple as a CBM every two weeks or every month, because you know that they are receiving the instruction that they need. But as students start receiving more targeted or intensive supports, you want to increase the frequency of your assessments because we don't have a lot of time to spare. We are, students usually do not have that much time in intervention and you want to make sure what you're doing in, in intervention is really targeted to their needs and meeting their needs. And so these data help us make good decisions as we go through an intervention program about what's working and what's not. So in core or tier one instruction, universal, this is where we're using screening measures. So this is where we're having measures that we administer on a regular basis. Usually I'll mention in a minute how frequently, but a couple of times, a few times a year. And the purpose here is to sort of make sure that we're catching a student who may be falling behind in order to give them additional supports. 
Once we move into targeted and intensive interventions, so students are getting interventions, we move into using CBM data to monitor their progress over time. So let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So first, screening is administered to all students. I have a feeling um, in your, a lot of folks who are on here in your districts because of this initiative that you're doing and the work that you've been doing in your state, that a lot of district, your schools are probably doing screening and universal screening three times a year. So beginning, middle and end of the year. And this really looks at whether how students are performing compared to benchmark targets of performance for that grade level. So it allows us to sort of say early on, this second grader should be performing at this level, but they're behind. And so we need to provide something else for that to make sure they don't continue to fall behind. And so Benjamin Franklin has a quote, where he said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so this little bit of time we spend recognizing that students might be falling slightly behind or missing a skill or need additional support will prevent a lot of time and resource and effort and frustration for the students as they move through grades. Benjamin Franklin, of course, was talking about forest fire prevention, but the quote still works for our purposes. Um, and we really wanna make sure prevention when students are very young, but even prevention as they get older, preventing later difficulties. So even for fourth graders, preventing later difficulties as they move into middle and high school. And the challenges related to literacy just increase every grade. And so when students fall behind, the demands that are placed in front of them continue to grow every year. And so it becomes their risks in that they don't have skills needed in the next grade and they continue to fall behind or struggle. Um, but then there's also psychosocial outcomes related to struggling with reading, knowing that they're behind or not getting the support that they need and feeling frustrated with their school experience. There's quite a bit of evidence showing that it becomes more and more difficult for students to quote unquote catch up as they move through the grades. And so if students have not attained proficiency by fourth grade, it becomes very difficult for them to catch up with their peers over time. So when we think of benchmark, this is just a quick screenshot example of a couple of CBM systems. It may look like ones that you use, um, but essentially when you collect this universal screening data, the system that you use will often give you um, algorithm-driven recommendations about the level of need for your students. So th they often have these sort of red, yellow, green systems. So they're very easy to look at and interpret. And it tells you right away, the yellow area, students seem to be falling a little bit below benchmark. So maybe take a closer look. Red means they are falling below that benchmark. So they probably need some additional targeted instructional support. So for that group of students who needs the additional targeted instructional support, hopefully they will be moving into intervention. And at that point, we want to make sure that we're using progress monitoring data to continue to make good instructional decisions. So we want to track students' responsiveness to interventions. And really, I, more than students' responsiveness, we're tracking whether or not we are making good instructional decisions that meet the needs of our students. And so these progress monitoring measures are administered more frequently. Um, they are interpreted over time. So they are not an, unlike a universal screening where we sort of look at the beginning of the year as a, a, a photo of how or a screenshot of how students are doing and make a decision. We look at progress monitoring data over time and we look at how students are changing from week to week or from data point to data point. The frequency with which we're collecting this should also increase with the intensity of their intervention. So students who are receiving tier two or targeted support, um, at least monthly you're collecting these data or biweekly every second week. And as students move into tier three, so the students who need the most individualized targeted support, we should be collecting progress monitoring data weekly so that we can make really good time sensitive decisions about how our interventions need to change. And I will, you'll remember I said earlier how quick and easy these are to administer. And so once you get into a routine of doing this, administering it weekly really just takes a few minutes out of intervention. It becomes a part of your regular schedule for intervention. And I had an animation to bold that point, but I already said it and didn't use the animation. So now let's just skip right through. So these are a couple of websites that I mentioned. I will throw out a few websites. 
um, this is kind of where you might go to find different CBMs. And so your school may already have a system that you're using. You might want to use something different if you're in doing more intensive intervention and you want to collect additional data. Um, so these three websites are on the resource list that I mentioned. You can check them out. The National Center on Intensive Intervention has a tool chart where you can go through, you can select the content area, the grade level, and it gives you a summary of the evidence and support for different kinds of screening and assessment or progress monitoring measures. So this progress monitoring data in tier two, where students are receiving standardized Pro supplemental reading intervention, we're using this progress monitoring data to decide whether or not what they're receiving is working for them, whether or not it's enough, um, or they need something more or something different. But as students move into more intensive intervention, tier three, um, and a lot of our students who have persistent difficulties and who may have dyslexia often move into tier three or intensive services, we really need to be using these data to engage in data-based instruction. And so thinking regularly that all of the decisions we're making around our instruction are driven by students' data. And so when we think about this data-driven instruction, we're thinking about students who are not responsive to standardized research-based reading interventions. They need something more. They need something that's more intensive or more individualized to their specific needs. And so this process of really intensifying and individualizing has to use data to make sure that we're doing just that. And so I'm gonna use throughout this the acronym DBI for data-based instruction, but data-based instruction uses CBM or uses other kinds of ongoing progress monitoring data, but it's a systematic ongoing process of using student data to determine when to intensify intervention and how to intensify intervention. So I'm gonna walk through the DBI process. I've had lots of fun animations and I forgot they exist. So they just keep popping up after. <laughs> um, I hope you're, <laughs> you're enjoying them. I will stop calling attention to them as we go. Um, so I will walk briefly through this DBI process um, in this figure that was developed by the National Center in Intensive Intervention. I've modified it a little bit. Um, but as we go through, I'll talk about using CBM data to make these decisions about when to intensify intervention. But then I'll talk about other types of data you might collect to determine how to intensify intervention. So when you start DBI, we are working under the assumption that we have started with a supplemental intervention. It's delivered in some, some, some format of small group. And that as we've adopted that supplemental intervention, we've made decisions about matching that intervention to students' needs. So we've thought about things before we've even started the intervention, like the strength of the intervention. So is there evidence that this program or this intervention is effective for students with dyslexia or students with word level reading difficulties? The dosage of this intervention. So are there a lot of opportunities for, feet, for practice, feedback, opportunities to respond in this intervention? Um, is it aligned with the student's areas of need? Um, and if you are someone who works with older students, it often becomes true that students have um, persistent word level reading difficulties, but the intervention that they might be receiving targets broader skills around comprehension. Um, and so they might need something that really looks specifically at their word level difficulties before they move on to other types of intervention. And then also comprehensiveness. So is it a program that uses explicit instruction? And is it set up in such a way that students are learning to be independent in practicing these skills over time? So when we think of choosing this foundational intervention, a lot of, a lot of when I work with schools, a lot of things we see is that we have really good tier two standard protocol programs that we're using. But when students are not responding to those, it may be because they have difficulties that aren't being addressed in that intervention. And so looking at word level reading difficulties, which is central to the definition of dyslexia, and not only that, but 
for students who struggle in reading, the most common difficulty that students have in reading occurs at the word level. And this is true for young readers. It's also true for older readers as they move into the second grade, that they often continue to struggle at the word level, but with more advanced word reading skills. So they may have gotten proficient with a really good phonics-based instruction or evidence-based explicit instruction program in early decoding of single syllable words, but as words become more complex, they don't have the strategies or skills to decode those bigger words, those more complex words. And so we wanna make sure we're thinking of how our interventions really align with students' needs. So where to find interventions? Hopefully you have some already available to you that are great. If you were looking for new ones or your district or schools looking for new ones, there are many websites that you can visit. Um, I also have a picture here of an IES practice guide where they have recommendations of how to of different interventions. And the links to all of these websites are also on that resource list. So we've started a great intervention. We are now gonna collect progress monitoring data. And so as we collect progress monitoring data, where I'm for, for the narrative sake, where I'm collecting progress monitoring data once a week with my students who are receiving intensive tier three intervention. And as I collect these data each week, I'm going to graph these data. And that will allow me to interpret my students' progress over time. So as I'm setting up my graph, the first thing I want to do is set a goal for my students. So when I'm monitoring their progress, when I'm looking at their data, I need to compare it to something to know whether or not, I mean, I can look at whether or not they're improving, that's great. But I also want to know whether they're improving toward a level that I want them to by the end of my intervention period or the end of the year. And so when students are receiving tier three intensive intervention, we want to make sure we're setting a goal that's really individualized. If we're using a grade level benchmark as the goal that we're measuring them to, they're pro measuring their progress to, that goal is often too high for them. And as students become older, this becomes even more true. And so that doesn't mean that our ultimate goal is not for them to reach a grade level performance. That might be an IEP goal for them. But if we're interpreting their graph, we want to have a goal that is set at where they're at and individualized to where we want them to be. And so this, I have a reference on the hand on the handout that has an article that I wrote with one of my doc, past doctoral students that talks about how to set goals. So if you're interested in this process, if we go into a little more detail there, but this is just a really quick chart to kind of give you an example of an individualized goal. These are norms that were developed by Lynn and Doug Fuchs a number of years, many years ago at this point. Um, and they give you kind of a general idea of how to estimate out where students should be over time. So for example, if you have a third grade student, you, we would estimate that an oral reading fluency measure, they shouldn't be increasing about one word correct per week. And so I would set a goal that looks at where they're at at baseline, when I'm starting, that multiplies looking at how many weeks of intervention I'm putting on my graph by one in this case. So easy multiplication for me because I'm not, I'm, I'm a reading researcher, not a math researcher. So keep it simple with the times one example. And then that give tells me where I want them to be. So if their baseline was 78 words correct per minute, um, and here I have in the example down here, I have two. So that's assuming they're a first grader, um, to increasing two words correct per week and 10 weeks of intervention, then I would assume at the end of 10 weeks, they should be at about 98 words correct per minute. So that's giving me a very clear idea of the progress that students should be making that helps me understand whether or not my instruction is meeting their needs in order to keep making this progress. So this is a sample CBM progress graph. It's it's based on real student data, but it's just kind of drawn up for 14 weeks. The number of words correct, so each of the CBM data points are the blue dots that you see that are graphed. That goal that I set that we just talked about is the orange line. And so over here at the beginning of the this orange line, I'm starting with where my students were at baseline. And at the end is at the end of this intervention period, this is the goal. This is where I want them to be. And then this dotted blue line is their trend line or their slope. And so this is a calculated trend across all of their data points. And this tells me over time whether or not my student is making progress toward their goal. 
And so this baseline data point, you often will have this if you're collecting universal screening data. If you're starting new, um, traditionally you collect three CBM probes and you average them, that becomes your baseline. Um, if anyone is using Dibbles, their new Dibbles 8 actually doesn't have the average of three anymore. It just has one probe. Um, so that saves you a little bit of time at baseline. And once you have baseline on there, you'll continue collecting data each week. If students are extremely variable in their performance, which is often true for students who have reading disabilities, they have, there's a lot of variability in how they perform week to week, then you need more data to get a stable trend. And so if you have a student who has, who has these sort of ups and downs, these peaks and valleys in their data over time, then if you just have a couple of data points, that's not really enough to show you a stable trend of how they're performing. So with that graph, the next thing you'll do is decide whether or not students are adequately responsive to instruction, whether this instruction is working for them. And to do that, we use the graph to compare the student's actual rate of growth, that's the trend line that I was talking about before, to their expected rate of growth. And so I changed the graph, it's not colors anymore, a little more simple, but their goal line is this, the solid line, the dotted line is the trend line that goes straight through their data points. And you can see that as I look at this graph, I can interpret and understand that my student has not is not making adequate growth. So if I continue in this trend, or if we all continue in this trend, they're not gonna get where I want them to be at the end of the year or at the end of the intervention period. And so I will need to adjust something. And hopefully looking at this graph, I would have tried adjusting something a little bit earlier on so we don't get this far into the intervention period. A couple of things, um, part of what I do, part of the research that I do is focused on graph interpretation and database decision-making related to graph interpretation. So a few things I always like to call attention to in looking at graphs is to pay attention to that individualized goal we talked about before. Um, it is very common to look at a graph and a student's trend line is significantly below their goal consistently even though they're making progress week by week. And so that's really hard for you as a teacher because you want to see them making progress toward their goal, but it looks like they're never getting toward their goal. And so making sure we're using an individualized goal for the purposes of data-based instruction. So we're not talking about screening here, we're talking about intensive intervention. To pay attention to the variability in students' data points, this is very typical. Um, you should not be alarmed by variability in student data, and you want to make sure that the way you're interpreting accounts for variability. So you're looking over time to interpret this. It is very common for students, especially students with disabilities, to have outliers, so data points that are significantly higher or significantly lower than how they generally perform. Um, there's many reasons why this happens, and I'm sure you can think of some right off the top of your head. So it, it should not be alarming or it shouldn't sort of trigger us to make an automatic instructional change if a student has a data point that goes significantly higher or significantly lower. And then so if the student's actual rate of growth, I'm going to go back to this for a second. So their actual rate of growth, this trend line, the dotted line, is lower than their expected rate of growth, the goal line, then it's an indication that we should adjust something, that something needs to be changed so that students can make more progress with this intervention. And so, and I'll come back to this in a minute, sort of how do you change instruction? That doesn't mean that the intervention needs to be thrown out, that it's not working for them. Often these adjustments can be very minor things we change in the instruction that we're delivering. So before we make an adjustment, the first thing we have to do is ask ourselves if we have enough information to determine how the instruction should be adjusted. And so that brings us to the next step in this progress process, diagnostic assessment. And so the measures we're using that I've been talking about, ORF, are very sensitive and very helpful for determining whether or not students are making progress but it is not, fluency in and of itself is not an isolated skill. It's a proxy for overall reading achievement. When someone, when any of us show fluency in our reading, that is a proxy for many other skills working together to show up as fluent reading. 
And so we can make a good decision about whether or not students are making progress using oral reading fluency data, but it doesn't necessarily tell us why a student is not making progress. It doesn't tell us their areas of needs or their gaps. And so this is where diagnostic assessment data comes in. I'm gonna give you three different examples of things I like to use for diagnostic assessment. So one is if you've been administering oral reading fluency probes every week, you could, when you administer, be a little more specific about writing all of the types of errors that students make. And if you have been doing that, you can actually go back to the data you've already been collecting and do an error analysis for the types of reading errors they've been making. So are there words that they just don't know? Um, are there certain patterns? You can see this is a, a very rough kind of sight words, beginning sounds. This would be primary grades, short vowels, long vowels, silent E. Are they, every time they see a word that has a silent E, do they get that incorrect? That right away tells you they probably need more instruction in that area. My personal favorite is, as, as a reading interventionist, is a spelling error analysis. And this has students spell words. And then you do a more in-depth analysis of the types of spelling errors that they're making. And this gives us information about what we might want to target in the intervention and what skills they might be lacking or what they didn't master as we were moving through a program. So this is from um, a spelling error analysis uh, document that Louisa Motes created. It groups sort of different categories of skills that students are developing. And then as students make errors, we can keep track of where those errors fall to decide what kind of instruction they might need. So going back for the ORFAIR analysis, I gave the example of, arc of silent E's. So you can see if a student had to spell hate and they wrote H-A-I-T, that might tell you that they are having difficulty with silent E or they don't know how to use that, apply that to their writing. Um, but it can also tell you that they need more instruction and more explicit instruction and practice with selecting vowel patterns. And then the other is using a phonics inventory. Um, this phonics inventory is in the Hooten Mifflin Harcourt package. It comes with their program, um, but there are many phonics inventories. You can access a lot of program intervention programs, have them in, in their materials. Um, and there are others that are available for free online. Um, Key Phonics has one available for, for free online. And so the students have a word reading list. They read through these words. Um, these are all, these are, these have a combination of real words and pseudo words that they go through. And then you keep track of words that they read correctly and incorrectly. And they're grouped around different kinds of skills. So you can see here, they're grouped around long vowel spelling, spelling patterns, R control vowels, I control vowels, and then variant spellings and diphthongs. All right, so we have really great diagnostic assessment data. That information should help you decide what kind of in intervention adjustment the student might need. Um, and I'm gonna go through a few examples of the types of adjustments students might need. I will actually say one more thing about diagnostic assessment and I'll come back to this with the adjustments. But the other thing is that the diagnostic assessment data you collect might also include behavioral data, observation data, data on how students are um, attention, engagement, motivation. These are things that can impact a student's response to intervention as well. So it may be that the adjustment needs to be something not related to the content of the reading that your reading instruction you're providing, but something else about the group. So ways that you can adjust instruction, the most commonly recommended instructional adjustment is around dosage. And dosage is the number of opportunities to respond that students have. So this is increasing the duration of the intervention, the frequency, the length, how much time you see students, or reducing the group size. Um, I always start with this and say, it is the most frequently recommended. It is the hardest to implement in practice. So for those of you who are providing reading intervention in schools, you have set schedules and you have set groups. So it's not usually as easy as just saying, well, this student needs 10 more minutes every instructional period. And so I'm just gonna add that on um, because you have a schedule and you have other students who are coming to see you as well. 
The next other, the other kinds of things you can do to adjust would be alignment. So this is really looking at your intervention and thinking about, okay, these are my students' main, main areas of needs. What is included in this intervention package? Are there skills my student has already mastered that I don't have to spend time repeating, that I can get into more time and more focus on the things that they need to work on? Am I trying to connect, if possible, to their grade level curricular standards, to what's happening in their classrooms, in their core instruction? Can I try to make sure that they're taking back what we work on into the classroom with them? The next is the other thing is pur purposeful text selection could be a way to think about alignment. So the types of text you're using, whether or not they're at the reader's appropriate level so that they can actually practice fluent reading and making sure they have lots of opportunity to read with feedback from you as the instructor. Um, you could also have, I think I have coming up right here. Oh, I thought I did, but I didn't. Um, you could also have students read with partners where you teach students very explicitly how to give one another feedback. And that can give you time and intervention to do more targeted support with students who need explicit skill instruction while students have text reading practice with feedback. And also simple things like as we're choosing text, making sure that we're also choosing, we're using decodable text to practice very explicit skills that students are learning, but we're also using rich narrative text. We're making sure our texts are culturally relevant for our students and their lives and their experiences. And that to some degree that they have a, a ability to choose different kinds of text that they might want to engage with. The next is thinking of the comprehensiveness of our instruction. And so this is something that we can sort of stop and think about our own instruction of how we can be more explicit and systematic in the delivery of our instruction. Um, this explicit instruction is extremely important for novice learners, for struggling learners. And some of the key elements are things like really targeting critical skills, not having a lot of extra things that we're talking about being cumulative, so always going back to what we learned before, being clear about our goals and expectations for instruction, having an adequate amount of modeling and guided practice before we expect students to do certain tasks, step-by-step -step demonstrations, and clear and concise language, which is often very difficult for me too. I find myself talking for five minutes and then I need to stop and say that was not clear or concise enough let me summarize the main thing we need to get at. So I will leave you just in thinking about explicit instruction. If you want to learn more, I will direct you to um, the website developed and book by Anita Archer and Charles Hughes on explicit instruction. There are a ton of really great, very practical suggestions of how to be more explicit in the way that we teach and the way that we provide feedback. Thinking of attention to transfer, this is another way to adjust. So making sure that we're helping students transfer skills to different formats or different context. And the most simple example of this that I like to give is helping students transfer learning an isolated sound, an isolated grapheme phoneme correspondence or spelling pattern, then translate transferring that to a word and then transferring that to text. And for those of you who works with students with reading disabilities, it's very common for students to read very fluently and do well with a word list. And then we move to text and suddenly they seem unable to recognize words that they were reading before. And so really supporting them in this transfer. Um, I have an example here of like learning the sound R, A-R, reading that sound and that spelling pattern in a number of words, and then moving into connected text that also has that words. So this is obviously very simple connected text. And then having a lot of opportunities for practice. So we know that when we learn a new skill, the more we practice it, the more proficient we become with it. So as students learn new skills in intervention, making sure that they have a lot of practice with using those in text. And I am cognizant of the time and I wanna leave a bit of time for questions. So I'm gonna to skip to this next one. Um, and the last one is behavioral support. So I mentioned before, you might need to collect additional diagnostic assessment data here. Um, but thinking really about how students, psychosocial, social, emotional, behavioral, um, learning interactions with your, in, your instruction and your intervention can impact their responsiveness to that intervention and making sure that 
we're integrating behavioral supports, motivational supports, self-regulation supports, if that's necessary for students. And then after we've made an instructional adjustment, we continue to monitor progress after we've, we've implemented that and continue to go through this process, always monitoring how students are doing and adjusting our instruction accordingly. So I will leave you with 10 big takeaways and then I think we have time for questions. So kind of going through thinking of MTSS and all of the different points, these are my 10 big things. One, making sure that research aligned core instruction is being provided. That is essential to success of any MTSS system um, and any implementation of good instruction across MTSS. Making sure we're using universal screen, screening to identify students who are in need of support. Delivering high quality interventions for students who are in need of support in small groups, so targeted interventions. Making sure that our instructional delivery is explicit and systematic. Number five, in making sure that students have many opportunities for reading practice with feedback. Six, provide collect ongoing data to monitor student progress and increase the frequency of, of collecting that data as instruction gets more intensive. Set individualized student goals to understand their progress and at an individualized level. Graph student progress data so that you can easily examine their rate of growth and make good instructional decisions. Collect informal diagnostic assessment data to identify skill gaps and needs of students. And then I intensify intervention in an ongoing way to ensure that our interventions are meeting students' needs. So I will leave you with back to the John Steinbeck quote. Um, and there's a second part of this quote that I always say for the end of the talk. So again, it starts, some people there who being grown forget the horrible task of learning to read. It is perhaps the greatest single effort that the human undertakes and he must do it as a child. And then he goes on to say, or write rather, I remember that words written or printed were devils and books because they gave me pain were my enemies. Then one day my aunt gave me a book. I stared at the black print with hatred and then gradually the pages opened and let me in. The magic happened. And I always end with this quote because you are here, you are spending time in this webinar and we all have the goal of the magic happening for our students to making sure that they are able to access literacy, that they're able to access information um, and access the world that becomes available to us through text. And I will leave you with that. Thank you. I have my email address and website here, and you're welcome to reach out at any time. I will turn it back to Jessica for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Toss. That was an amazingly informative presentation. So thank you for all of that. We do have a few minutes for questions, which I'll begin in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to mention the companion document that we've created for each webinar. The webinar companion document includes prompts to discuss after attending the webinar, should you want to with your school district or your PLN, and additional resources to further explore the webinar content. The webinar companion documents and recordings can be found at scoe.net slash CA dyslexia or on our Padlet as well. So the first question that we have is, can you please clarify whether CBMs help teachers identify dyslexia or evaluate risk? Um, good question. They they could do some of both. So if you're using CBM for universal screening purposes, the primary purpose is to evaluate risk. So it's to evaluate whether or not students may be falling behind and require additional support. Um, but I would usually see that screening, these kinds of screeners that we're using as an entry point to then moving to identify students who have dyslexia. So understanding that if students are having difficulty, why are they having difficulty if they're getting intervention um, and continuing to have difficulty that can tell us more about the need for them to perhaps be referred for a dyslexia, a full dyslexia evaluation. Okay, thank you. Um, another question refers to RAN assessment as part of a CBM 
um, group of assessments. One participant's district does a RAN screening in kindergarten because the research shows that RAN doesn't significantly improve over time. She had asked an initial question, um, should they just do RAN one time a year or aim for three times a year like other CBMs? And then there's a second part to the question, which is if they do do it one time a year, let's say in kindergarten, should they do different types of RAN in subsequent years? So perhaps colors in kindergarten, letters in first grade, numbers in second. Um, I think there, so this is the question I wish I could answer not on recorded, on recording. <laughs> um, there are different ways of thinking about using RAN data. I would say um, it's probably most helpful to collect it I mean, if you're, if you're, it's a short battery. So I, it's helpful if you have it three times a year to look at progress over time. Um, I would probably collect it once a year um, only because for me, I don't think it gives as much information to inform instruction. Um, so that is probably what I would do. Um, and then yes, you would, uh, you would uh, change up the type of, of probe that you're using each year. And they usually, um, if you're using a system that's already developed them, they usually assign them already to grade levels. Um, so they would have colors, shapes, um, they would move to letter naming and then letter sounds. Um, and there are also some with numerals as well. So number naming, digit naming. Okay, great. Thank you. I know that's a, a complicated one. So I appreciate you addressing it. Um, we do have time for about one or two more questions. Would you mind moving to the next slide where we can just show everyone sure. the um, the survey? So Wynn will put the survey link in the chat. And while we answer these remaining two questions, if you could start to fill out the survey, that would be wonderful as well. Um, so the next question is, screenings in the core level is clear. Can you clarify how often screenings should take place in targeted intervention? and in more intensive intervention? Do you recommend one CBM over another or what type of assessments are used to screen more frequency, frequently? Yeah, so I would, in, in tier two, I, at the minimum, you wanna collect CBM data monthly for the purpose of progress monitoring. If you're able to collect it bi-weekly, so every second week, that's even better because then you're able to interpret your graph sooner. You have more data to give you information on a graph. Um, and then as students be, receive more intensive intervention, you wanna increase the frequency. So in, I always suggest in tier three or more intensive in, interventions, that you're collecting data weekly. Um, and in my research projects where we're collecting data, we collect data weekly in order to make, to have a graph that allows us to make instructional decisions. And I, for intensive intervention as well, I also su suggest using ORF data as the, the probe that you're collecting and graphing and using to make instructional decisions. And that's just because fluency is such a strong proxy for overall reading achievement. Okay, excellent. Do you have a recommendation for who should be able to access the screener and prog progress monitoring data? Uh, do you suggest that it's a teacher, an admin, a district lead, or all of the above? Um, I think everyone should be able to access it, um, I hope, um, especially the teachers who are providing instruction so that they can know more about their students and make good decisions. Um, if, if it's about who should implement it is the question. Um, so access it, should be everyone, I think. Um, implement it for a universal screen. I think what often works really well is to have supports that to conduct those universal screening periods. Um, when you're looking at students who are in intervention, whether it's targeted or more intensive intervention, I think those are best delivered by the teacher delivering the intervention. They can make it part of their intervention time, but then they also have the data in the moment right after it's administered so that they can look at it and make instructional decisions as necessary. Okay, perfect. Um, a final question we have time for is what measures should teachers or admin looking to take on assessments be looking for in terms of the CBMs they're delivering? So what, what are they looking for? Um, in terms of, do you, 
In terms uh, of selection, like, selection but... <laughs> like skill types. So should they be looking for phonological awareness measures or phonics measures or fluency measures? And what does that yeah, look so like? So in kindergarten and first grade, you're going to look at the more foundational skills measures over time. Um, I am a big fan of optimizing our time and really focusing on oral reading fluency as students get older. Um, and the CBM system that you use, almost all of them, their ORF measures start either in middle of first grade um, or right around there. They differ slightly by system. Um, if you have time to have a, if you do a larger battery, um, then it's helpful, to, it's helpful to focus on the skills that you're expecting students to be developing in that grade level. So in first grade, even if you're doing ORF, you may also do um, a phoneme, phoneme task or a grapheme phoneme correspondence task, something that gets more at word level skills and their phonics development. I, wonder. I wasn't sure if the question was about how do you choose which CBM system to- I don't believe so. Uh, I think it was more about what are you looking for within a, a CBM that would support identifying risk. So thank you so much, Dr. Toss. This was a, a wonderful hour and we just appreciate on the behalf of Glean Education and Sacramento County Office of Education and the California Dyslexia Initiative, really appreciate your time today and all of you who came to join us today to hear Dr. Toss' presentation. Have a great day and thank, thank you, you so, so much. much.